Falcon was, in fact, the object of special attention and admiration. By 1930, fortune was suddenly beaming on this hard luck convalescent. Although his home life had collapsed for a variety of reasons and he was now separated from his wife, his novels were acclaimed. The movies were beginning to adapt them and to pay for the privilege. And he himself was working in Hollywood as a scriptwriter at a salary of $800 a week, a fortune in those days. Like a man who could not quite believe in his success, Hammett spent the money as fast as it came in on all the trappings of celebrity. Limousines with chauffeurs, bootleg liquor in defiance of the prohibition law, starlets and hotel suites. Of course, the high living wasn't compatible with either his precarious health or his financial solvency, and he was soon down on his luck again. In fact, the second half of his writing career was not nearly as successful as the first, and in the last decades of his life, he died in 1961. He seemed to take on a kind of backup, supporting role to his longtime friend and mistress, Lillian Hellman, herself a very distinguished, successful writer. Dashiell Hammett therefore became another in the long line of people who have demonstrated the truth of Kipling's description of triumph and disaster as those two imposters. Throughout it all, however, Dash Hammett maintained his own unique integrity. He rejected much of conventional morality and propriety because of what he saw as its hypocrisy but he stuck to the code he had fashioned for himself. This meant, for example, that in 1951, he went to jail for five months because he refused to testify against four fellow communists on trial for conspiracy, and he suffered other forms of official harassment also. In summary, then, the clearest connection between Hammett's life and his work is that his detectives, including, of course, Sam Spade of the Maltese Falcon, live essentially in a world which is the mirror image of Hammett's world. And their perspective on their world is the same as their author's outlook. That means they are not optimistic about the present or the future, and they are confident only in themselves. The people Sam Spade knows are not basically good. They are ambiguous, sometimes just decent enough, but often selfish, cynical, and cruel. The society these people have made, with its laws, its police and courts and businesses, is just as flawed as they are. Spade and many detectives of his stripe are called hard-boiled for a good reason then. In their jobs and in their lives, they can't afford to be soft or open or trusting. They know that if they let down their guards, they are all too likely to be hurt physically and emotionally, and perhaps even killed. They derive this no illusions, guarded sensibility from Dashiell Hammett. It was, in large measure, what life had taught him. Finally, we should understand that this hard-boiled attitude of Sam Spade and Dash Hammett represented a dramatic shift in the underlying outlook of detective fiction. In classic tales of the genre up to this point, the status quo of society was cast as the norm, the safe harbor for all. And crime was a dangerous aberration perpetrated by freaks and alien outcasts. The discovery and the arrest of the criminals were treated in such stories as the restoration of normalcy and good order. In hard-boiled stories, 
like the Maltese falcon, the status quo was morally murky and there was no safe harbor for anyone. In our next talk, we will dig deeper into the Maltese falcon itself and analyze its plot, characters, and style. Until then, please allow me to say again, thanks for the pleasure of your company.